Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Area Center webinar series sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'll be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar, which is titled Developing Offshore Wind in U.S. Waters Part 2, Offshore Wind Development and the Structure and Function of Marine Ecosystems, which is presented by Dr. John Hare. If you are interested in seeing Part 1, please visit OCTO's website where the webinar is archived. John Hare is the Science and Research Director of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. He oversees science activities related to the NOAA fisheries mission in the Northeast region, including fisheries, aquaculture, protected species, habitat, and ecosystem science. Prior to becoming director in 2016, John spent more than 20 years as a researcher focusing on understanding the interactions between ocean ecosystems and fisheries populations with the goal of contributing to sustainable fisheries and species conservation. We're very excited to have Dr. Hare here today, but before I turn it over to him, I would like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your questions in the question box, which is found at the bottom of your control panel, often found on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will pose the questions to the panelists at the end of the presentation. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Hare. Thank you very much, Zach, and thank you, Sarah, for uh, hosting me. Um, and thank you all for attending. And again, I'll be talking about offshore wind development and the structure and function of marine ecosystems. So just to give you a little bit of a you know roadmap of where we're going, um, you know, first I need to thank a number of individuals who have sort of you know helped inform my ideas around these issues or doing a lot of the work that I'll be talking about. Um, you know, people from NOAA, from Bureau of Offshore Energy Management. Um, you know, I'm, I'm acknowledging these people for contributing to these ideas, um, but I wouldn't attribute any of what I say to these individuals, attribute it to myself if you have any questions. So the outline, just to give you sort of an idea of where we're going, uh, first I'm going to really just quickly touch on offshore wind energy development to make sure we're all on the same page. Then I'm going to talk about NOAA Fisheries role in offshore wind energy development and spend some time talking about marine ecosystem science and then end on sort of a discussion about complex socio-ecological systems. So offshore wind energy development, um, you know, it provides uh, an important role in terms of mitigating climate change. Um, it represents a domestic renewable energy source um, and it's an abundant energy source and located near uh, load centers located near areas that use a lot of electricity. So um, that's you know the rationale for developing offshore wind. Um, if you sort of think about where we are today and where we're going in the future, um, this is from a DOE Department of Energy site. It's their offshore wind market report from 2022, um, and the the sort of showing the year on the x-axis and the cumulative installed capacity of offshore wind on the y-axis um, you know they're sort of thinking that there'll be a three and a half time increase in fixed offshore wind um, by 2027 globally and then a 68 time increase in floating offshore wind by 2027 and so the the point here is that the the scale of offshore wind development is increasing rapidly globally. Um, we also know that there's a lot of interest nationally. Um, so there are leased areas and call areas in three regions uh, along the East Coast, um, which is shown on sort of the right-hand side of this plot, on the West Coast, which is on the left-hand side of the, of the graphic, and in the Gulf of Mexico, which is on the, on the bottom of this graphic. Um, and this interest is is really being driven by states uh, either committing to uh, clean electricity or interest in clean electricity. So it's a it's a rapidly developing uh, ocean use uh, nationally as well as globally. And then when we look at the Northeast region. Um, the Northeast region really is where offshore wind energy development is you know happening at the at the fastest pace. Um, there are a number of lease areas shown in orange. Um, there are additional call areas that uh, may have lease areas within them in the future. Um, and if you look at the timeline in the center of this plot, um, we have, you know, Block Island Wind was the first operational offshore wind farm uh, started in 2016. And then we have uh, Vineyard Wind and South Fork um, under construction coming online in 2023. 
New England Aqua Ventus 2024, Revolution Win, Sunrise Win 2025, Park City Win 2027, South Coast Win 2027, 2028, Commonwealth Win, Beacon Win. So the number of these developments are, are coming online uh, at, a, at a rapid pace. And so this pace and scale of offshore wind energy development is challenging within the Northeast region where I work. It's challenging nationally, um, and it's also challenging globally. Um, it's important, I talked a little bit about this with that DOE, uh, you know, looking at sort of the development of offshore wind to 2027. Um, there are two sort of main types of turbine technologies. Um, the first is a fixed turbine where the turbine is directly attached to the seabed. Um, this technology works in water uh, generally less than 60 meters. Um, it uses monopiles or jackets. Um, and again, in, in the United States, this is the you know, currently the most common technology being developed. Um, the other technology is floating, um, and these are shown on sort of the right hand of this graphic. So it'd be sort of a, a, a floating wind turbine uh, moored to the bottom, either you know with a, you know, sort of tight mooring in the center or sort of a loose mooring um, on the far right hand side. Um, this is for waters greater than 60 meters depth. Um, and this is what is planned for uh, West Coast development and Gulf of Maine development. Um, and there are currently three areas of the world where floating technology is deployed and generating electricity. It's off of Scotland, off of Portugal, and off of Norway. And so this, this floating technology is, is going to really increase rapidly um, in the coming years. You know, the other piece of offshore wind energy development is it's, it's more than just you know, a wind farm producing electricity. Um, there are four steps to the development. Uh, first step is surveying the area to be developed, and this is generally, you know, a two to four year process. The second step is construction, um, and this is typically a two to three year process. And then there's the operation, the generation of electricity, you know, 25, 30, 30 year plus part of the development, and then there's the decommissioning piece, you know, two to three years to, to decommission these energy developments. Um, and the other sort of piece of offshore wind energy development is it's more than just turbines. Um, you know, on this figure, uh, you know, the black dots represent turbines. Um, the turbines are connected by inner array cabling, sort of carry the electrical current from the turbine generator um, and then it's collected and carried to an offshore substation. Um, it's then exported through a cable from the offshore substation to an onshore substation. And then from that onshore substation, it's added to the electrical grid. Um, so the point here is that when we're thinking about offshore wind energy development, it's more than just the turbines. And so this makes offshore wind energy development a fairly complex uh, process. You have turbine technology, the pace of development, the stages of development, the scale of development, these different components of development, and there are other dimensions of complexity. So let's now think about what is NOAA's, NOAA Fisheries' role in offshore wind energy development. Um, you know, NOAA Fisheries, the agency, federal agency that I work for, is responsible for the stewardship of the nation's ocean resources and their habitat. Um, we provide vital services to the nation, all backed by sound science and an ecosystem-based approach to management. And the areas where we um, work the most are around productive and sustainable seafood, um, safe, safe sources of seafood, the recovery and conservation of protected resources, it'll be marine mammals, sea turtles, endangered species, and uh, working to create and promote and maintain healthy ecosystems. And so if you look at our authority, like why do we do this or, or how do we do this? Um, NOAA's fisheries authorities come from several pieces of federal legislation. There's the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act, and there are several others. So we work within these authorities uh, in the interest of the nation's marine resources. And so if we look at offshore wind and how it intersects with NOAA fisheries, um, the administration's goal 
uh, is to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind in the United States by 2030 while protecting biodiversity and promoting ocean co-use. So in this goal, we have offshore wind energy development. We have uh, promoting ocean co-use, so promoting other sectors to also be able to use the ocean and protecting biodiversity, which is uh, maintaining sustainable fisheries um, and meeting our requirements under MMPA um, and Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. So looking at sort of our role specifically in terms of offshore wind energy development, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the lead federal agency and primary decision maker regarding offshore wind energy development under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. So uh, BOEM is the decision agency. And then NOAA Fisheries has a number of different sort of responsibilities um, under that set of laws that I mentioned previously. Um, so NOAA Fisheries provides technical assistance, comments, and recommendations under NEPA and Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. Um, NOAA Fisheries conducts a Section 7 consultation and biological opinion, which uh, either finds jeopardy or no jeopardy decision. Um, and if no jeopardy is found, then an incidental take statement is issued through the Endangered Species Act. There's also a negligible impact determination requirement. And when this requirement is met, an incidental harassment, harassment authorization or a letter of authorization is issued through the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, there are also essential fish habitat conservation recommendations made under the Magnuson-Stevens uh, Fisheries and Conservation Management Act. And then all of this is supported by um, science to inform these recommendations and decisions based on the best available science standard. Um, and this applies to the, the, you know, all four of the bullets above, the NEPA recommendations, the Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act recommendations, the ESA determinations, the MMPA determinations, and the management, uh, Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act recommendations. So there's a, a lot of areas where NOAA Fisheries um, is working with BOEM in terms of offshore wind energy development. Um, and so when we think about it from a, from a science perspective, you know, I, 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 I'm the director of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Um, you know, the NOAA legislations are important to us. How NOAA is using science is important to us. Um, but our primary role is providing that science. And so our goal at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center across NOAA Fisheries Science Enterprise is to provide scientific support to ensure informed management recommendations and decisions based on the best available science. Um, and we have some fundamental science questions with regards to offshore wind energy development. What are the effects of offshore wind energy development on populations, communities, habitats and coastal and marine ecosystems, including humans. Um, how can this information be used in the scientific advice and regulatory process? Um, and can adverse effects of offshore wind energy development be avoided, minimized, or compensated? And so when I look at that, those science questions, what I see really is um, ecosystem-based management and science to inform ecosystem-based management. So ecosystem-based management is an integrated management approach that recognizes a full array of interactions within an ecosystem, including humans, um, rather than considering single issues, species, and ecosystem services in isolation. So for an example, um, we're not going to consider offshore wind energy development in isolation. We're going to consider offshore wind energy development interacting with the NOAA mission, so protected species, habitat, fisheries, and this trying to take an integrated approach to these considerations. Um, another definition for ecosystem-based management is an integrated approach that incorporates the entire ecosystem, including humans, into resource management decisions. And it's guided by an adaptive management approach. So, so you know, you make the best decision that you can make now with the best available science, but you continually work to improve your science to inform uh, future decisions. And so, just to summarize, you know, NOAA Fisheries' role is complex as well. We have you know, this ecosystem-based approaches. Uh, we have fisheries and aquaculture, protected species, habitat, socioeconomic, science 
management and regulation enforcement, and there are these other dimensions of complexity. So it's a, a you know it's becoming a very complicated issue in terms of offshore wind energy development and marine ecosystems. So let's talk a little bit about marine ecosystem science um, and how how we think about uh, providing science to support ecosystem-based management. So marine ecosystem science, again, we're, we're looking for science that promotes an integrated approach that incorporates the entire ecosystem, including humans, into resource management decision and is guided by an adaptive management approach. So when we think about that whole ecosystem, we have physical and chemical components of the ecosystem, we have biological components of the ecosystem, and we have societal activities and benefits um, in the ecosystem. So how do we work across these different dimensions of a marine ecosystem to advise, to recommend to BOEM about offshore wind energy development? I'm going to go through just a couple of examples um, in, in the, to give you an idea of, of some of the issues that we're addressing within um, NOAA fisheries. Um, so one point, one, one, one effect is this physical effect um, on the aerodynamics and hydrodynamics. So this top graph is a is a very simplified uh, way to think about how uh, ocean currents are affected by putting something in the ocean. So you you have a a current which is running from left to right. Um, it intersects with a, a foundation, call it a, a, a turbine, and that creates a lot of turbulence in the wake of the turbine. The figure, the the, the picture down below. Um, shows that same process, but it's a wake in the atmosphere. So you have uh, the wind coming from the lower left to the upper right, and you see these wind wakes um, behind these turbines. And those wind wakes are that wake turbulence that you sort of is illustrated in the figure above on the far left. Um, so this, this idea of uh, effects on uh, Aerodynamics in the atmosphere and hydrodynamics in the ocean um, is well supported, um, you know, from a physical point of view, but also well supported from an observational point of view. Um, and and sort of what this is going to do in the ocean raises uh, questions. Um, and this is the result of some hydrodynamic modeling in the North Sea, um, which finds an effect of wind energy development on sort of advection, the currents. Um, the vertical mixing and stratification in the water. So stratification are, are layers of different uh, water masses. And so the, the very, very blue spots that you see are wind energy developments. There are areas with wind turbines. And that very blue color indicates that the, the stratification in those areas is decreased by about 10 to 15%. So that's indicative of a lot of that turbulence uh, from the wake of the turbines themselves. But what's interesting about this, uh, this model is that you also see the, the whole area shows is in blue, which indicates that, the, that much of this area, the stratification is reduced, um, attributable to these wind energy developments, but much farther afield. Um, so again, uh, you know, providing model support for the hydrodynamic effects of wind energy development on our marine ecosystem. And then this becomes important uh, in an area like the Northeast U.S., uh, where we have a critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. So it's, it's listed under the Endangered Species Act. It's also a marine mammal, so protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, and this is a conceptual diagram because these, these links have not been substantiated by data. Um, but conceptually, these hydrodynamic effects of putting wind turbines in North Atlantic right whale foraging areas would increase the turbulence, which could affect the productivity of phytoplankton and zooplankton. Uh, North Atlantic right whales feed on zooplankton, the tiny animals that are in the water. Um, and, and so this, this, this conceptual cause effect impact pathway are you know, wind turbines, increased turbulence, effects to productivity of North Atlantic right whale food, thereby affecting North Atlantic right whale health 
and potentially um, population. So it's sort of taking that physical effect on the ecosystem and there's this potential biological interaction which we are working currently now. National Academy of Sciences has a working group to evaluate um, this hypothesis, this conceptual cause-effect impact pathway. Thinking about another way in which offshore wind energy development affects ecosystems is this artificial reef effect. Um, if you put something hard in the ocean, you're creating an artificial reef. Um, that can be a subway car, or it can be a, a bunch of rock, or it can be a wind turbine monopile. Um, and you know, an artificial reef, reef effect is well supported um, from a number of studies done not specific to offshore wind. Um, but you know, a turbine represents physical hard structure that can then support a diverse and abundant artificial reef community. Um, and this can affect populations of, of food, of predators, of fish, of providing shelter. Um, this artificial reef effect has been demonstrated. Um, this is a, a graph is from a study done at the Block Island Wind Farm, Wilbur et al. Um, and they found, so it's a, in the study area before and after wind energy development, in a reference area before and after wind energy development, and in another reference area before and after wind energy development. And what these investigators found was a, a you know, approximately a tenfold increase in the abundance of black sea bass in the study area, um, which because of the study design, they can attribute to uh, the development, wind energy development in the area. Um, and black sea bass is an important commercial and recreational species in this region. So it, this, this effect intersects with fisheries uh, and fisheries interest. Um, it is unclear at this point whether this increase in black sea bass is due to you know an attraction to these this habitat or if it's due to uh, an increase in productivity of the population and that question is going to be very important for us going forward um, looking at that sort of artificial reef effect you know from a meta-analysis perspective so looking at all the studies that have been done uh, a paper by Lisa Mathrata and Derek Derek uh, in 2019, they looked at 13 studies similar to the Wilbur study, um, and they found uh, uh, the mean effect uh, size as being significantly positive. So what that means is that when you look across these 13 studies, look across all the species, um, there are an increased abundance of fish in wind energy areas compared to outside of wind energy areas. Um, and you see that increase for fish who prefer soft bottom habitats and that prefer these complex habitats. Um, you don't see the increase though for fish that prefer pelagic habitats. So this artificial reef effect has you know, excellent support conceptually um, and now uh, experimentally and through a synthesis of studies. Um, and so it's another way in which the physical structure can impact um, the biological interaction. Um, and the next two examples, I'm just going to step through much more quickly. Um, one is related to uh, underwater sound. All phases of wind energy development create underwater sound. Um, and for most species, uh, the impacts uh, of this additional sound um, are really not that well understood. For most life stages, for most populations, and for most communities. Um, and there is a real need to understand how this additional sound will affect uh, the marine ecosystem, both at, within a project and then also uh, you know, cumulatively across projects. Similarly, um, when this electricity is transmitted in that intercable array among turbines, and then from the wind energy development onshore and that export cable, um, there will be electromagnetic fields created by these power cables. And that, that's uh, sort of illustrated in that upper left, uh, the little brown circles are the electronic electro, electromagnetic fields surrounding the power cable. Um, you know, initial assessments indicate that the impact of this EMF fields is negligible. And I've shown a table here in the, 
the lower part of the right hand side that sort of you know goes through a number of species and goes through the steps of this assessment and then the yellow indicates that in for all of these species uh, the assessment uh, concludes that there'd be negligible impact um, that said there are you know experimental work that you know does show uh, fish uh, in this case the, the paper here is for haddock um, do respond to these electromagnetic fields. And so, so many species, marine species, can sense uh, electromagnetic fields. Um, and by sensing electromagnetic fields, there is an open question as to what would the effects be of you know, adding a lot of electromagnetic fields to the marine ecosystem. What could the effects be on, on individuals, on populations, on communities? Um, and so now sort of that's you know sort of four examples of physical effects and their impact on the biological interactions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, human interaction. So this uh, graphic shows um, data from vessel monitoring systems which are on commercial fishing vessels. And so red means you know a lot of commercial fishing uh, vessel activity. Blue means uh, much less commercial fishing activity. And then you have the, the wind farms, which can be a little hard to see, but these lease areas here um, along the coast. And so, you know, the offshore wind energy development overlaps with fishing activities. Um, and it's important to understand, you know, what are the consequences of that overlap? Uh, most of the offshore wind energy development is occurring in federal waters which means that these fishing activities are permitted federally, so permitted through NOAA. So, you know, an offshore wind activity off of Rhode Island, um, it's not only Rhode Island fishermen that are going to be impacted by that because the federal fishing permit allows fishermen from Maine to North Carolina to fish in that area. So it's a one project is gonna have this regional effect on fisheries. So just sort of stepping through some of the, the complexities and nuances of those effects, um, this shows two wind energy areas uh, off of New Jersey. Um, and this is some information that's available on a Northeast Fishery Science Center website that looks at uh, fishing revenue across all the leased areas in the Northeast. And that site's here below. And I'll share this slide deck. It'll be available uh, to come and look at these links um, after the talk. So we have two wind energy areas that are reasonably close in proximity. Here shows the, the, the landings um, from those two different areas over time. So from 2008 to 2021. Um, and, and the main point that I want you to take from this is on the, the wind energy area on the left, um, much of the landings are green um, and that's sea scallops. Um, and the wind energy area on the left, on the right, um, is light purple. Um, most of those landings are surf clams and ocean quahog. So although these wind energy areas are very close in space, their fishing profiles are very different. Um, and so when you think about how do these, how do the, just the specifics of fishing interact with the specifics of offshore wind energy development? Um, there was a, a International Council for Exploration of the Sea workshop in 2021 that, that brought together a number of experts, uh, fishery scientists, fishers, offshore wind uh, expertise to look at what are sort of the, the interactions between fishing activities and offshore wind. And this is a you know, a conceptual map that that group put together. And you can see that it is quite complex. It's not simply, uh, you know, displacement to loss of revenue. There's the value of the fishery, the scale of the fishery, you know, that intersects with the labor market, operational safety, added costs. Um, so this issue of offshore wind energy development and fishery interactions is quite complex and something that we're going to need to work through. Um, two other uh, human interactions uh, that are, are very relevant to what I do. Um, another piece of offshore wind energy development is it's going to affect the surveys that 
NOAA Fisheries does to understand the status of the resources that we are responsible for managing. So this slide, this, this figure shows um, sort of our the area of our sea scallop survey and the area of our ocean quahog survey. Um, and then you see the wind energy development area superimposed on that. So it is likely that we're not gonna be able to continue our survey operations as they are conducted now in these wind energy development areas. Um, so we have this preclusion of our sampling platforms. Um, this survey, they are statistically designed, uh, random stratified design. And so the, the wind energy areas themselves are going to disrupt the random statistical design of this survey. So we'll need to really think about redesigning the surveys um, and think about sort of how we're going to get sampling platforms into the wind energy area. There's also habitat change. You know, I talked about that artificial reef effect. Effectively, you're putting in new habitat which is going to attract some species or displace some species. Um, and understanding what those habitat effects are going to be is, is important for us in terms of thinking about our survey design. And then we have this sort of impact to our sampling, how we, how we move through this ecosystem to sample. Uh, you know, we're working on ships. Uh, you know, it's likely a ship may not want to transit through a wind energy development, so it needs to transit around a wind energy development. And that starts to add time and cost to survey operations. In the Northeast, we have 14 long-term scientific surveys that will be impacted. Um, and we're working through uh, you know, a very explicit survey mitigation plan currently. The other human interaction which is relevant to the work that I do is this effect on fisheries and fisheries management. Um, and, and much of this is still unknown at this point. Um, but in a wind energy development, you know, there's likely to be exclusion of some fishing activity. Um, so, you know, that is a marine protected area effect, you know, a partial marine protected area, full marine protected area effect. The, the species in a wind energy area are going to be less available to fisheries than, than species and individuals outside of a wind energy area. Um, this displacement of fishing effort from wind energy areas will then cause a, an increase in fishing effort outside of those wind energy areas. And that's you know, a displacement effect. Um, and that's gonna be important for us to, to understand how this is, affects fisheries and how this affects fisheries management. Um, we've talked about the artificial reef effect already, the possibility of attracting or increasing productivity in these wind energy developments. And that's something we're gonna need to consider in management. Um, and then there's also a possibility that, that fishers will change their gear type uh, in terms of accessing those areas, which could then in, in turn change the selectivity of, the, of that gear type. And that change in fishing behavior then needs to be considered um, through the fisheries management process. And there are potentially other uh, impacts to fishing and fisheries management as well. This last, you know, sort of effect, this last sort of marine ecosystem slide, um, you know, talks about these cumulative impacts. Um, so, you know, we have one turbine creating an artificial reef effect. Um, you have a project of 100 turbines creating 100 artificial reef effects. You have 3,000 turbines in the Northeast region uh, creating artificial reef effects. And so what are the cumulative effects of this artificial reef effect when you multiply it across turbines, across projects, across the region? Similarly, you know, we've got sort of um, that sort of oceanographic hydrodynamic effect, one turbine increasing turbulence, one development increasing turbulence, uh, you know, a, a region with multiple 20, 25, 30 developments increasing turbulence. So really thinking about the, the multiple wind energy development projects, how are they going to create, what are the cumulative effects that they're going to create? Um, we have multiple scales of biological organizations. So we have life history stages, we have individuals, we have populations, we have communities, we have ecosystems. We have multiple habitats. We have benthic habitats, pelagic habitats, coastal habitats multiple environmental effects, physical, geological, chemical, multiple human interactions, fishing, shipping, coastal communities, the use of waterfront. And so the question is, 
you know, what is the cumulative impact of these different factors on, and you can list any one of your NOAA trust resources. What is the cumulative impact on the endangered North Atlantic right whale? Um, what is the cumulative impact on black sea bass, which is an important fishery species? Um, and you know, I don't have the answers here today, but it's an important issue for us to, to really work on with regards to marine ecosystem science. And so this idea of marine ecosystem science is also complex. Um, you have sort of this coexistence uh, with sort of fisheries management. You have these cumulative impacts. You have coexistence with fisheries. You have the electromagnetic fields. You have sound. You have artificial reef effects. You have the aero and aero and hydrodynamic effects, sediment dynamics, ocean productivity, coexistence with our science activities, and these other dimensions of complexity. And so this issue. Um, offshore wind energy development and sort of how it intersects with the marine ecosystem is extraordinarily complicated. Um, and these are just the components that we've sort of touched on here today. Um, and there are many more that we could add. There's, you know, co-use of the ocean with sectors other than fisheries. Um, there are the, you know, habitat effects of cable burial and sort of modifications to um, the bottom of the ocean. Seabird interactions. Uh, how is this all going to intersect with climate change? And there's a lot more. So it, it's an extremely complex issue that we are, you know, understandably needing to find out more uh, to inform the decisions that are being made now and, and that will be made next year and that will be made, you know, years from now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sort of this complex socio-ecological systems before as, as a way to sort of wrap this up. So, you know, we're looking for our goal is science that promotes an integrated approach that incorporates the entire ecosystem, including humans, into resource management decisions that's guided by an adaptive management approach. Okay, those are relatively simple words to say, um, but hopefully, you know, walking through some of those examples and looking at all the different pieces, you understand the complexity um, that is embedded in those three lines. So, you know, trying to sort of really shifting gears and thinking conceptually about science, um, you know, very excellent paper by DeFries and the Grigender about, you know, how ecosystem management is a wicked problem. Wicked problem is a term that comes from the, the policy world. Um, and this DeFries and the gender identified two traps in these wicked problems. The first trap is, is assuming that there is one right answer um, and continuing to strive to that one right answer. Um, and their second trap is this inaction from just overwhelming complexity. You know, how many bubbles did I have in that plot? And just saying it's too complex for us to work in this space. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. So those are the two traps that they identified. Um, but there are ways for us to address these complex socio-ecological systems. And that comes down to this idea of you know, defining the ecosystem components, defining the ecosystem interactions, taking sort of a physics to people approach, really working to integrate um, and stay at that synthetic level um, and then being adaptive. And that being adaptive from my perspective, I think is key. Um, and that's sort of using adaptive management principles. And this, this figure here is the adaptive management you know, principles laid out, you know, you, you develop your plan, you implement your plan, you monitor your progress, you learn from that, and then you redevelop your plan um, and sort of re-implement, re-monitor, and relearn. And so, you know, there's no, again, there's no one solution. We need to work adaptively to continually put forward the best solution that we have and then work to continue to learn and adapt our solutions as we move forward. And this is what you know the NOAA fisheries um, and others are working on. Uh, Responsible Offshore Development Alliance uh, is leading an effort in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, NOAA and Northeast Fishery Science Centers are partners. Bureau of Ocean Energy Management are partners. University of Rhode Island are partners. And it's called the uh, Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. And you see in this uh, visualization of an integrated ecosystem assessment, you see that sort of iterative adaptive component to it. So integrated ecosystem assessments are an approach that integrates all components of an ecosystem to inform decision-making process so that managers can balance the trade-offs um, and determine you know, how they are more likely to achieve their desired goals. 
Um, another key part of working in these complex systems is working collaboratively across a number of partners. Um, and these are the partners uh, that Northeast Fishery Science Center is currently engaging with in offshore wind in the Northeast region. Uh, I may have left a few out, and if I did, I apologize. I didn't have any more room on this slide, but uh, please contact me and we can sort of add to the partners that we're working with. But certainly collaboration is key. Um, also, this international collaboration is key. You know, many people say to me, well, you know, Europeans have been, you know, producing power from offshore wind since the mid-1990s. Clearly, they've learned all the lessons and we just need to learn from them. Um, it's not quite that simple, as you can imagine. Um, but we are actively engaged with the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, which is the 20 countries um, that surround the North Atlantic. Um, and we are really working with them to, to learn from what their science shows about offshore wind energy development and then to contribute what we're doing here in the Northeast. Um, and it's turning into a very active um, international space uh, to provide the science that we need to inform uh, really to inform ecosystem-based management, to inform multiple use um, of our marine ecosystems. And so again, coming back to the questions for NOAA, you know, what are the effects of offshore wind energy development on populations, on communities, on habitats, and on coastal and marine ecosystems, making sure that we're including, you know, the human and societal uh, elements and dimensions. Um, and then we really need to think about how is this information going to be used in the scientific advice and regulatory process. So one of the benefits of, of sitting in NOAA is the ability to connect the science to the decisions that are being made. Um, understanding how the decisions are being made and understanding what information will be most uh, beneficial to informing those decisions. So as a NOAA scientist, I can really work at a, as in that translation role. Um, and then, you know, the sort of next question, you know, can adverse effects of wind energy development, if there are adverse effects, can these effects be mitigated? Can they be avoided? Can they be minimized? And can they be compensated? And so, um, you know, that's sort of where we are. Um, just some last slides to just provide some, you know, some materials for those of you that are interested in, in learning more. Um, an excellent paper by Lisa Mathrata at the Science Center that identifies research priorities in the Northeast US continental shelf uh, for us at the Northeast Fishery Science Center to pursue. So really sort of laying out the areas that we are currently um, wanting to work in. Um, and then there are a number of um, sort of sessions and documents that really sort of lay this out in much more detail than I can in 40 minutes. Um, there was a special issue of the journal Oceanography that you know, some of the graphics that I presented were taken from there. Um, there's a theme issue on offshore wind interactions and fish and fisheries and marine and coastal fisheries. And that theme issue is they're still adding papers to that. Um, there's a theme set in the ICES Journal of Marine Science um, assessing the impact of expanding offshore wind energy. Um, and they're still adding uh, papers and research results to that. Um, there was a fisheries and offshore wind interaction synthesis of the science. Um, that was led by the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance with support from Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, NOAA Fisheries and others. Um, and that uh, report is available. And then there's this uh, the NOAA Fisheries and BOEM Federal Survey Mitigation Implementation Strategy, which really digs into the issues regarding our surveys, um, Northeast Fishery Science Center surveys, and the interaction with offshore wind energy development. And then just the last slide, just the, you know, this idea of dealing with complex socioecological problems. Um, I, you know, I've been giving some thought and sort of how I would sort of work in these areas. Um, and here are a number of you know, five uh, sort of uh, seminars or papers that I've written to uh, help sort of get more information there if you're interested. So with that, Zach and Sarah, I will stop and I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm gonna stop sharing my slides so I can see everybody um, on the screen. Thank you, Dr. Hare. Uh, I will encourage the participants to go ahead and add questions to the question box. We already have a number of questions that have come in. To address one of them, the slides will be shared after 
uh, well, they will be posted along with the recording of this webinar. And all registrants will receive a link to the page on Octo where the recording of this webinar as well as other webinars can be found. So you'll be able to find the slides there, including all of the links that are included in the slides. So we have a number of great questions that have already come in. And uh, one of the questions that, well, a few of the questions that have come in have revolved around the level of scrutiny that goes into allowing offshore wind development to occur. So we actually have a theme here where we have a few people wondering if you can speak to the difference in the level of scrutiny given to offshore oil and gas versus wind along the theme of the questioners getting the impression that wind energy is requiring a greater amount of scrutiny before being uh, being implemented than offshore oil and gas. But on the flip side, we also have a few people asking if we're putting the cart before the horse, saying that it looks like decisions might be being made on offshore wind before we have all the scientific information on impact. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to the process that goes into making these decisions and how it relates to decisions that are made uh, with along with other offshore activities that might have an impact on ocean life. So uh, again, I'm a scientist, um, and I, you know, I attempted to summarize sort of the the regulatory process, and I will answer the question from my understanding. So my understanding is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the decision uh, agency for both oil and gas and for offshore wind. Um, and then NOAA fisheries responsibilities um, are the same for both of those types of activities. So, you know, it's commenting uh, under NEPA and Fish and Wildlife Coordination Act. Um, it's the, you know, the, the two, um, you know, decisions that we need to make regarding negligible impact um, and jeopardy, no jeopardy, and jeopardy, no jeopardy under uh, Endangered Species Act and negligible impact under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and then our sort of essential fish habitat recommendations. Um, you know, and the, they are recommendations to uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the action agency, um, and so they're, you know, they are uh, making decisions for both oil and gas and offshore wind. So. Again, I don't, there's no oil and gas development in the Northeast US, um, so I don't have a perspective on, on sort of comparing the two, um, but um, I think that from a fisheries perspective, the, the process is the same. Great, thank you. Yeah. We also have a number of questions revolved, uh, revolving around the slide you shared that talked about the electromagnetic field produced by the, the uh, produced by transmitting the energy. Specifically noting that people didn't see marine mammals listed there and wondering whether or not there is any research related to the effect on marine mammals, particularly their navigation, noting that on the West Coast in particular, some marine mammals appear to use electromagnetic fields to uh, guide migrations. I mean, that's an excellent question. I do not know. Um, I can sort of look into it. Um, you know, so it's basically, you know, electromagnetic fields could disrupt the, you know, the, the migration movements of animals that sense a magnetic field. Um, and, you know, some fish sense a magnetic field. Um, I, you know, I know that some uh, sea turtles sense a, an you know, electromagnetic field, magnetic field. Um, I, I do not know if marine mammals do or not. Um, and so I can certainly look into that. Um, and if the individual who asked the question wants to email me, um, I can sort of respond to them with what I'm able to find out. Great, thank you. We also have a question that came in asking about the change in stratification, specifically uh, wondering how much is related to changes in wind mixing or the effect of hard structures in a tidally energetic system. We're trying to really trying to get their heads around how reducing wind stress at the surface decreases stratification. Yeah, so I mean the you know the the modeling results that I showed uh, were I, I believe were both. Um, you know, you're reducing, you're, you're taking energy out of the atmosphere. That's what wind energy development is. Um, so you're reducing, you know, wind mixing. Um, and then you're also, you know, putting a structure in the ocean, which is increasing sort of that wake effect in, in the background. Now, I do not know, I am not aware of a study that has tried to parse those two out. 
Um, but and that's that's the benefit of, of working with models um, because in, in a model you could work to parse those two out. Um, you know, just to, you know, speaking from sort of a northeast perspective, um, you know, we're waiting for that national academy. As mentioned, the national academy is looking at the issue um, from a you know northeast U.S. perspective. Um, we're waiting for the results of that working group, and then are very interested in do, you know looking at the modeling uh, to understand what those two effects would do off of Nantucket Shoals and related, particularly to North Atlantic right whale foraging. But in those models you could parse the, those two effects out. Yeah, very interesting results of the models. Thank you. Uh, given the benefits that offshore wind turbines can sometimes have as far as artificial reefs, we have people wondering whether or not there have been discussions about co-location of aquaculture on uh, with offshore wind development. So, I mean, you know, again, speaking from a scientific perspective, you know, I know there are discussions. Um, but I am not aware of any projects that are moving forward with co-location in their plan. And so that's, you know, that's up to the, you know, the, the companies that are developing the projects. Um, you know, that's where that co-location discussion um, would, would be happening. Um, you, know, I've, you know, there's a lot of discussions around it. Um, but I do not believe any of the projects in the Northeast are moving forward with co-location at this time. Great, thank you. Someone wondering, uh, noting that most of the analysis you shared has been traditional, looking at potential impacts based on past behaviors or data, and wondering if you're aware of any work that's been done looking at scenario planning, so relative to species abundance and distribution under projected climate or effects that wind development might have under projected future climate? So it's an excellent question. And so the, I'm trying to think of how to sort of capture my thoughts around this. So there, on the East Coast, there has been a very well-developed sort of scenario planning activity in the, in the fisheries sector um, relative to climate change. Um, thinking about the interaction between climate change and offshore wind energy development, um, I'm not aware of scenario planning being used as a tool, um, but it is something that we are talking about both, you know, in that within NOAA Fisheries and then that broader the international group that I talked about, ICES, um, you know, trying to think about, you know, how does offshore uh, marine renewable energy development uh, overlap with climate change and how do those two you know, affect marine ecosystems. So it's an excellent question. Um, I think the science is going to begin moving there. You know, it's probably already starting to move in that direction. Climate scenario planning is an excellent tool uh, to sort of take those first steps. Um, so I would expect to see more of that type of activity in the coming, you know, year or two. You know, it, one, you. just but one, you know, there have been some work done at the Northeast Fishery Science Center that, you know, we can sort of model fish distributions and then project those distributions in the future. Um, and there is some work going on now to look at the overlap between fish distributions, offshore wind energy development, and then projected fish distributions and offshore wind energy development. So that, you know, that work is beginning. Thank you. Someone asks, understanding that there's a lot of money and projects floating around, whether or not you are aware as to whether or not any Inflation Reduction Act or bipartisan infrastructure law funds have, to your knowledge, gone to trying to address some of these questions, given that these questions are clearly important. So, I mean, I, I can speak from a NOAA fisheries perspective and from a you know Northeast you know perspective. So, um, again, we in the Northeast, you know, we have a number of challenges, right? We have offshore wind energy development occurring at a, a rapid pace at a large scale. Um, we have climate change, you know, that's also a, a large scale factor. Um, and so in terms of thinking about how we're going to do science in the future, um, we're not we're not sort of distinct, we're not distinguishing this is how we're going to address offshore wind energy development and this is how we're going to address climate change. So we're we're trying to we are working to take a holistic approach to how are we going to do science in the future. From that holistic approach, um, there will be some Inflation Reduction Act funding 
uh, that we can use to help inform sort of that change in how we do science. So, um, you know, just last week, uh, we know a fisheries announced an $82 million investment of IRA funds into the North Atlantic right whale issue. Um, you don't see that as, you know, uh, it's not tagged as offshore wind energy development, it's tagged as North Atlantic right whales. Um, but clearly there's an interaction between North Atlantic right whales and offshore wind. So as we work that North Atlantic right whale question, we will be working it with the idea that offshore wind energy development is also occurring in the region. Um, and so that type of, you know, overlap is how I would describe, uh, you know, NOAA fisheries using Inflation Reduction Act funding. Uh, you know, there are other departments that have also gotten Inflation Reduction Act funding, but and I don't want to speak for those other parts of the federal government. But we are, you know, uh, you're not going to necessarily see anything that says offshore wind energy development, but how it's how those funds are being applied in the Northeast will be applied to address the challenges that I laid out regarding offshore wind energy development and the NOAA fisheries mission. Great, thank you. A uh, question that's come in notes that given the NMPA allows for certain take of marine mammals and the recent cetacean strandings being investigated in the Northeast, what information are you aware of that NOAA might be able to provide for informal educators at marine mammal facilities to answer questions from public visitors? So are you aware of anything that NOAA or anyone else might have available to help these informal educators answer questions that they're getting about this potential interaction? Yeah, I mean, there, we do have, uh, you know, a frequently asked questions web page that addresses that topic. Um, and again, if the individual wants to email me, I can send them that link. That that web page is updated frequently. Um, and you know, we, you know, there, we can also sort of help, you know, put connections among different groups that you know are sort of working in this space as well. I do want to say, you know, the incidental take authorization you know comes up frequently you know it's take as defined under marine mammal protection act which includes mortality and harassment so you know we are not authorizing uh, mortality of these animals um, the authorizations that are, are being given really are sort of incidental harassment authorizations but they're termed take authorization because that's the term of art um, in the law. We've lost some audio there. Yeah, and just while we're trying to regain audio, if anyone is interested in contacting me, you know, my email is john, J-O-N dot hair, H-A-R-E at NOAA, N-O-A-A dot gov. Okay, I think Zach's uh, still working to get in. Um, John, let's see. I haven't been following us exactly which questions we've gotten to. We probably have time for Am one more. Yes, you're back yeah, now, Zach. All right. I apologize for that. All of a sudden, um, my GoToWebinar could no longer detect my microphone, which is interesting because clearly I have one. <laughs> um, yes, I would just, sorry, now I need to find another question. Um, I would say that there are a number of questions it, coming in asking about prioritization between fishing and offshore wind, particularly given that fishing activities were there first. Are you aware of any kind of discussion around prioritization between activities like fishing that might predate offshore wind leases and offshore wind and how that's being worked out? I mean, you know, that is a major conflict. You know, I think it's obvious to most. Um, you know, the idea of prioritization, that is a policy call. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that people are thinking about it as one is more important than the other. You know, the administration's goal is promoting ocean co-use. So from a NOAA fisheries perspective, you know, we're trying to work to, you know, support offshore wind energy development and support uh, commercial and recreational fishing. And so, 
you know, that's that's where we are from a, a NOAA fisheries perspective. But you know, science can inform those types of decisions, um, but science is not the is not the decider in those types of decisions. Great, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. We have a got a bunch of questions, so thank you all for your engagement. I apologize that we didn't have time to get to all of them. Uh, but hopefully we can get them answered in some other way and hopefully the the resources that dr hare has provided in his in his powerpoint that will be posted on the octa website along with the recording can help to get at some of these questions so with that i want to again thank dr hare for a fascinating webinar and thank all of you for your participation Look out for the recording for this webinar to be posted the next couple of days and for our next part of our offshore wind series, which we will get some information on in a number of weeks. So thank you all and hope to see you at our next Octo and Marine Protected Area Center webinar. Thank you very much, Zach. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for joining.